Welcome to this, the last in the HNPW series, um, the priority area of integrating security risk management across humanitarian action. My name is Lisa Riley. I am the director of GISF, Global Interagency Security Forum. I'm very happy to be here today um, just to light touch chair for the um, presentation that's going to happen with uh, some excellent speakers who are real experts on this topic around mis and disinformation and what it really means to us working in the humanitarian sector um, and the implications for security in terms of what we do. This really forms part of a bigger um, picture that we're looking at at the moment around um, security in a digital world. So beyond the idea of digital security, which is often considered to be, you know, the, the realm of the geeks, um, our world has changed and the context within which we work, the way people communicate with each other, the technology that's out there is really changing the context in which um, humanitarian action happens and the way it's implemented. And we need to make sure that security is keeping pace with that and is proactive in reflecting what the needs are for humanitarians. Um, as always, a few housekeeping rules. Um, so the event is planned for 90 minutes. If you haven't done so yet, do please introduce yourself in the chat so we have an idea of who's here, uh, what countries you are calling in from. Really nice to know. We are recording the event. Um, this is for note taking purposes for us, but also a summary version is shared with HNPW and will form part of their um, website of um, resources following the, following the end of the event. Um, if there's anything at any point that you wouldn't want recorded uh, or included in that recording, do please let us know. It is an interactive event. We will be expecting you to join in, so do please do so. Um, if you could stay muted, unless we ask to unmute yourself, that makes it a bit easier for everybody. Not seeing any faces yet. It's really great if you feel like putting your camera on so we don't feel that we're just talking to a, a blank screen. Um, if any of you fancy turning your cameras on. Um, if you've got any technical issues or problems, do reach out to my colleague, Megan, who you'll find under GISF production in the chat. Um, and we will be having a Q and A session. So if you've got any questions, put them in the chat. Um, and they'll feed into the Q&A session, which sort of brings me to the agenda in reverse order. <laughs> um, so what we will do is we will start with presentations from our two expert speakers. We have uh, Professor Lisa Short, um, who is so difficult to summarize her bio into one or two lines. So I'll just say Lisa is, um, really an expert around technology, um, around the communications in particular and security issues related to that. Um, and she brings all of that knowledge into the humanitarian sector uh, to support what we're doing here, which is great. Uh, main bio will be in the chat so you can find out more about her. And our other speaker is Sandrine, uh, Sandrine Tiller, who works with MSF. Um, as part of MSF, she's really leading the work that they do on misinformation and um, disinformation, and has really become a major resource for the whole sector in terms of that work that they're doing with MSF. So it provides an opportunity for the rest of us to learn um, from the work that they're doing. So it's really great to have both Lisa and Sandrine with us. Um, after the presentations, we will have a look at a couple of case studies um, to unpack those um, and, and really sort of put into practice some of the things that we're talking about. And that will be followed by a Q&A at the end. Um, I think that's 
it. Just look at Megan though, there's nothing else that I need to say. So on that note, very happy to hand over to Lisa. Thanks everyone. Thanks for that. And I will just share screen now as well. There we go. Well, thanks everyone uh, for joining. And uh, as Lisa has said, this session uh, is around tackling misinformation, disinformation in the humanitarian response, which obviously is a, a really critical area for us to discuss. And I just wanted to open the session with uh, a quote from Interaction. And I'll, I'll give you the resources for this uh, shortly as well. But the urgency and consequence, I think it's a really good statement, the urgency and consequences of the work of civil society and international NGOs during crisis are one reason disinformation attacks on their work have certainly proliferated in the last uh, few years. This trend has been accelerated by the rapid efficiency with which disinformation can be created, it's almost an industry, and disseminated to local and international audiences. Um, it competes directly with fact-based reporting from legitimate news organisations, which I think is important, and of course, social media. But unfortunately, bad actors, whether they're either state or non-state, do have or may have strategic, tactical, political or economic interests in exacerbating tensions, sparking conflict and scapegoating humanitarian organisations. And I guess that, it's a, I know it's a long paragraph, but I guess that really sums up why this session is so important because it, 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 <coughs> excuse me. it has been a proliferation in the last two years in particular. Uh, it is an ongoing issue um, though I think we've, it's almost the Pandora's box that's, that's been opened and we, and we haven't been able to solve yet. So I think that's a good um, framework and foundation for us to lead into this session. Um, the resources are here. I know that um, Megan can send these out and pop these in the chat as well, but we've based a lot of this session around three uh, resources. The first one is mis Mis and Disinformation Handling in the 21st Century, and it was a, um, a uh, UN OCA report uh, published only in February 2020 this year, uh, and it was in partnership with the Digital Humanitarian Network uh, and um, written predominantly by Christian Peer and Nan's Andre Verity, I think that's how you say it. A very good report if you want to read uh, the full details of that. But we've based some of the case studies and some of the information around that and some of the key findings out of that report, which I think is important. I've also brought in some other, other resources. Um, one that was very important was the second one, how our outbreak became a pandemic. Um, and that was the defining moments of the COVID-19 pandemic, a really interesting report from the Independent Panel for Preparedness and Response. Um, and again, it was published, um, the, the companion to this was published in 2022. So very recent documents. And these were on a global level, some of the challenges that misinformation and dis disinformation had uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the last one is uh, a blog um, that I've also put the link there for. You can't handle the truth, misinformation and disinformation. Um, and this is by uh, Rachel Yu. And uh, again, we'll refer to that at quite a few of the case studies and the information that was uh, developed in that, in that report. So some really good resources, and that's really what we're basing this, this session on, so that you can actually follow it up with some uh, more information. Out of that blog of Rachel's, I think this uh, sentence, and as in the, the next slide, is, is really quite profound. False information spreads faster than true information. Uh, MIT did a really large scale study and found that, in fact, false stories travel six times faster than true ones. And notably, this was not found to be the work of bots. And this is the thing that I find fascinating about this. And I think it's a very important takeaway for everyone out of this session, because we often do blame technology. But in fact, as it turns out, bots shared true and false stories at the same rate. And it was in fact humans who were more likely to share false information. And that's because of uh, the next slide that the study also found that there was two qualities of false information. Uh, it, it, first of all, they gave it an advantage over true information, which I think is, is again, uh, when you think about it, is, is quite ironical. Two things, novelty 
and anger. False news was more likely to be novel because it's false. And so it, it creates a curiosity and an interest that uh, engenders thought and curiosity in, in people. And it's often charged with anger. And so it does seek to provoke a reaction. And that's really why it spreads so fast. You know, we get onto the, the WhatsApp and we, do, we get something through and we just automatically send it out. So without a critical engagement and really broad digital literacy, literacy skills on behalf of the readers, the novelty catches their attention and the attention compels them and their anger compels them to pass it on. And so it does get a reaction from us. And so we're probably all guilty of doing that at some, at some point without checking the veracity uh, of information that we've, we've read. Now we want to leave the session with a Mentimeter activity. And I know Megan will bring this up on the screen just to get you all, all involved and ask you some questions. But I think uh, Megan's put the into the chat. Uh, you can either access Mentimeter from that link there, menti.com 169V, that, that code, or you can go to menti.com and you can enter the code on your um, computers or your devices, either mobile or your, or your desktop. Um, now, I'll stop sharing, won't I, Megan, and you'll bring Mentimeter up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. And the code for the Mentimeter is also in the chat. And there's three questions that we want you to think about and to ponder and to type your, your answers in. Now, if anybody does have a, a problem with Mentimeter, by all means, if you have an answer, you can also pop it in the chat. <coughs> Um, but usually Mentimeter works okay, but I know one of the last sessions we had, we had a few challenges in there. So just give everybody just a minute just to make sure they're in. And the first question is, why do you think false myths and disinformation are considered such a high risk in the humanitarian sector? Just keep your, word, your answers really brief, um, you know, one or two words or, or a single sentence, yeah. But why do you think False myths and disinformation are considered such a high risk in the humanitarian sector. So we'll just give you a few minutes to reflect on that. There's a good one. Spreads lies, uh, spreads lies, it's a bad thing. Undermines trust and neutrality of the humanitarian sector. That's a really important one and does have an ability to incite violence. Jeopardizes the safety of all actors involved and scatters coordination efforts. Yes, it does, it dilutes them as well. You need the confidence and buy-in of the people, correct? I'm going to lead into that in the presentation that I do. There's some good answers there. It disrupts the work, correct? It does. Also makes it more costly, uh, those disruptions, when, when you're on fixed budgets as well. Can influence the effect of your operations, correct? It can. So there's some really good responses there. We might move on to the, I think we've, we'll just give it a few seconds and then we can move on to the second question. So the second question I want you to think about, um, just to get your, your mind sort of into the space is, how do you think that the intent that initiates false mis and disinformation differs? In other words, what's the, what's the uh, if you're talking about false information, misinformation and disinformation, what is it about intent that differs between those three. Uh, you know, what causes it? What incites people to actually engage in the process? So again, just simple answers. So this one's really about um, the reasons why or the intent behind it, yes. So misinf misinformation is intended to deceive. So the intent is deception. But it could be other things as well, not just deception. Some other thoughts? What else might it do? What, what are the other, some of the other uh, purposes, the, the reasons why people would... Uh, engage in those behaviours to, to perpetrate um, misinformation or disinformation. Political motivations, that's another really strong one, yes. 
personal or political gain, absolutely. Might be part of a bigger agenda or, or, or political propaganda, absolutely. Social engineering um, through the use of misinformation is a huge challenge because the more, um, the more we can push that information out and get the volume of information out to the number of users, we can actually influence people and influ influence actions. Divert humanitarian assistance, yes, that's correct, it can. It can actually be used obviously as well to incite violence and the intent can, can actually sometimes be deliberately to incite violence. Political propaganda, absolutely. And of course, you know, we do see that a lot with, um, you know, nation state actors in particular between, um, you know, some of the states, you know, obviously with the, the, the crisis that's happening in Ukraine, we are seeing a lot of political propaganda coming out of Russia, for example. We might move, move on to the third question. And the third question is, what steps do you think need to be taken to minimise the dissemination of false myths and disinformation. So what do you think are some of the basic steps that you might take either as an individual or as an organisation to minimise the spread of misinformation and disinformation? What might you do or might, what might the organisations do? Give everybody just a couple of minutes to, to, it's a little bit slow sometimes to pick up the responses. So the steps you might need to take, the things that you might need to do, might be use yourself as an example. And again, let's use the example of, of you know, you've received uh, you know, a message through WhatsApp that's, that's uh, told you some information, a news article, and you forward that information on. Uh, and it turns out to be misinformation or disinformation. What could you have done differently to have prevented that spread of information? Right. Rely on a variety of sources and facts checking. Yes, triangulate before sharing. So make sure you actually do check the facts and where the sources are and what's, where, where the information has come from and whether, whether that person actually did create that information. Um, be better at sharing true information in a way that makes it more easily uh, disseminated. Yes, that's correct. Yep, so fact sharing. Any others? Everybody's very quiet. Must be getting it because it's getting to the end of the HNPW weeks. All right, we might... If everybody's finished, and I'll just check that there's, oh, there we go. Say, say what you do and do what you say. That's a really good one, actually. Yeah, that's a good one. And consider and challenge potential biases within our own teams. Absolutely. Fact check before sharing information. That's, that's also quick. I would say there not to be too quick. Sometimes to just pause before you actually do share information. That's another a, a good following on from that. Sometimes it's just a matter of just taking a moment to think about it and go and check the facts before it's forwarded on. Because unfortunately, a lot of the social media channels and things, we're very instantaneous in our responses. So just to slow that down a little bit would be great. All right, we might, um, if everybody's finished with that, some great responses and a good way to get going on the session. And if, yep, and I will start sharing again uh, the presentation. Okay. Oops. All right. Now, my session is actually going to be focus on trust. Just give me two seconds. I've got some background noise. I'll just make sure it's... It's always, always something like a tradesman starts working at the same time. Um, okay, so my session is focus on trust. Uh, and again, I like to introduce this with a, with a comment from Nancy Claxton. Now, Nancy is the Senior Officer of Health Promotions um, in the Community Emergency Health Department 
uh, for the Red Cross in Geneva. And she says that misinformation and disinformation are incredibly damaging to humanitarian organisations' ability to fulfil their mission and their response. To that, trust is critical. And the thing that misinformation and disinformation hurts the most is trust. If they don't have trust, they don't have compliance. So I think that's a really interesting concept is that our misinformation, disinformation actually leverages and impacts our focus on trust uh, of NGOs and humanitarian aid organisations. And that actually impacts your ability to function and have compliance and do what you do. And so trust is an important concept that's damaged from misinformation and disinformation. Now, you may or may not be aware, there's actually a barometer um, that measures trust. It's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And information underpins trust and the law. So in other words, the amount of information that we have out in the community actually does impact trust. And that measurement of trust in 2021 revealed quite an epidemic of misinformation and widespread mistrust of society, institutions and leaders around the world. Now, the register, and so this obviously was impacted through COVID, um, but adding to this is a failing trust ecosystem that was unable to confront what they called a rampant infodemic. Now, that term infodemic actually sort of evolved during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it did leave four institutions, business, government, NGOs, and media in what we called a state of information bankruptcy. That's the term that was used. So the trust barometer plummeted so much so that the main organisations realised that there is a mandate now for us to rebuild trust and chart, to chart a new way forward. Because the level of misinformation and disinformation has been so profound, the word bankruptcy in terms of information. Now, of course, that means that if this underpins what we know and what we do, it underpins trust in the law, that's the magnitude of the problem that we have. But information also underpins trust and humanitarian action because for your actions to be effective in, out in communities, out in crisis situations, um, doing what you do, what your core business activities are, it depends on relationships of trust between NGOs and key actors, including vulnerable populations. So they are, it's, it's quite a unique environment, um, but it also requires trust between those communities, obviously, and governments, non-state actors, and all the, all the key players and the stakeholders that engage in the humanitarian sector. But it's by maintaining these relationships that you are actually able to operate during crisis. Without trust of those ecosystem players, you can't function. So without trust, which is being impacted through misinformation and disinformation and hindered by it, there's actually no way for you to actually operate safely in a crisis, a crisis setting either. So, of course, in terms of security, whether it be physical, digital, psychological, all the parameters of, of security, you can't actually operate while trust is at a, an all-time all low and being challenged. So this is a really critical uh, conversation to have. Now, again, I, I, you know, really this... this uh, is another statement that came from the Independent Panel for Preparedness and Response. What they did was they actually, they studied the entire two years of, of the COVID-19 pandemic and looked at um, and determined there were 13 key defining moments of the last two years um, that contributed to the response, the spread, and the way that the, the COVID-19 pandemic manifested itself. And again, they said in a, in a fast moving uh, crisis uh, environment with unknowns, the stakes are high. Clear, and this is really important, even clear technical guidance that might be as black and white, they might issue something straight out of the World Health Organization. So information that we were getting to support NGOs and the humanitarian sector and the governments and everybody around the world and communities around the world, even information sources like that 
can make a difference between containment and rampant spread of the disease, as we saw. But even when those pieces of information which we know are factual and have come from an authenticated source, even they, when they're filtered through people with good intentions, whether it be at national and local level or governments, academics, influencers, all of the, all of the people that are there, accurate information can arrive fragmented. So it's almost like the Chinese whispers where unless we see the whole original document, often we'll see excerpts taken out of it or take, have sections removed or somebody repeats something, but they change one word. So it's the Chinese whispers conversation. Now that's a per perfect example of misinformation that may not in fact be deliberately intended to be malicious or caught, you know, deliberately caught to cause harm, but it happens almost by nature. So the challenge, so we've, we've got a problem just in the translation of information, but we also have disruptions when the intent, and the question that I was leading through in the Mentimeter, what's the intent? When we start having um, people who have a willful or political manipulation involved, you know, armchair experts, denialists, profiteers, bots, all of those things that we saw with information during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were so many armchair experts all of a sudden that became expert medical advisors. That made the results of misinformation even worse. And this was where actually the term infodemic was evolved from. And the International Panel of, of, of um, uh, Pandemic Preparedness did say that this was one of the most defining moments of the last two years and the crisis over the last two years, that misinformation and disinformation spread almost as fast as the virus did. And so that was quite a unique feature of it, um, again. So, but I think there's two important pieces of information that, that one, that even factual information can become fragmented and in fact can become misinformation through non-malicious reasons, just through um, Chinese whispers type activity, or you can have those where there is a malicious intent um, intended as well. So there's sort of two parts to that conversation. I show this slide and I've showed it, I think in the three presentations that I've done. So I apologize if others have been in the same precious presentations, but just for those who didn't, I do like to show this in, this, in the sense of the pervasiveness of the information that we have around us and the digital pervasiveness that we have. That it, and I love this image because it is about the fact that it's the, the amount of digitization, the digital world that we're engaged in is really like a fog. It's like an air that we breathe. And that digital environment is just absolutely so pervasive. It's in our lives everywhere. It is like the air we breathe. It watches us, it examines our habits, it listens to us, it records our knowledge, it influences our thoughts. If it does all of those things and it's being fed by misinformation and disinformation, of course, things like influencing our thoughts and changing the way we conduct business is influenced by that misinformation and disinformation. And it is a pervasively digital world, particularly the last two years where we've gone through 21 years of change in two years. So it has been quite profound. Just to give you some idea and some concept if you look here at the just the users of worldwide internet users in, in, the, in these figures are only up to 2019. So this was actually before the COVID-19 pandemic and we all, all obviously you know, reverted to being remote and, and even more digital than we were before. But users in the world is about 86% in the developed world. And in the developing world, it still sits at about 47% of internet users. But I think the figure of 15.5 is important because for every minute that transpires over this um, presentation, another 15.5, I was up the half, I'm not sure if you get a half, but that's statistics for you, will be added to those users. That's how fast we are being connected in the volume of people using the internet to move information around. And of course, that means the speed with which we can move misinformation, disinformation. There's also something like about 27 billion devices connected to the internet at any one point. And so if you look at that, that's like a perfect storm to be able to put a piece of information out there with an intent of causing harm and spread it quickly. So it's, it's one of the features of the environment that has created the beast that we are you know, having to, to, to work with. And this one's also uh, interesting. 
because this tells you the volume of data and information that's out there and, and helps you sort of try and quantify the information that we are being exposed to and the difficulty for us to try and overcome um, some of the, the information overload that we have to actually prove, well, is this true or not? I don't know. So if you think about this, up until about 2003, which is around about the time Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter all started to take off, um, so we started to generate user-generated content because of social media. But up to that point, up to you know, 2003 years of every written work of humanity from the beginning of recorded history in every known language is, is, is estimated to be a thing called five exabytes of data. And that's about as far as it's almost to Mars and back again in data. If you just put it all next to each other, it just means an awful lot of data. But now we are producing that same volume, 2003 years worth of data and information. We're producing that same quantity every single two days. So every two days, 2,003 years worth of information is being added to that, that digital space. That tells you how difficult it is and such a challenge that we have because of the volume of information that we have um, being produced. So there's some of the challenges. As well as that, we also know that 70% of all enterprise workloads will be in the cloud. So in other words, we are actually placing our trust in a pervasively digital world in a space where it's extremely difficult for us to churn through the volume of information that is out there. And so I think there are things we, could, we just need to be mindful of, um, which I think is important. All right, Lisa, can I just give you a time check? You've got yes. a left. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, and I wanna just, just quickly do the definitions. False information, just so we know that just, just, just the differences between the, the, the categories. False information is information that's spread regardless of intent. So false information is just false information. Um, misinformation doesn't care about intent. And so it's simply a term for anything that's wrong or false, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we've deliberately intended to do it. Disinformation, however, means there is a deliberate intent to mislead or put biased information or manipulate or nar narrative or facts. Propaganda, for example, is one type. So disinformation is knowingly spreading misinformation, whereas misinformation, we may just do it um, inadvertently, like I said before, e.g. Um, information from the World Health Organization. Propaganda is a type of disinformation and where it's deliberately designed to influence or create social engineering, so influence thoughts or behaviours. And the last category, of course, also, which is a, another form of disinformation, is hate speech. And of course, that's where it becomes abusive or threatening speech or writing that expresses prejudice and those sorts of things. So those are the broad categories that we have uh, of the types of information, uh, misinformation, disinformation. Misinformation has basically no intent, but disinformation has a deliberate intent. And of course, two of the worst of those are propaganda and hate speech um, because they can influence um, you know, others. So I think that's important. Very briefly to finish on, the key messages from the uh, UN OCA report were these were some of the challenges that they identified uh, in the report that has caused the infodemic. Social media platforms and the plethora of them, there's so many of them out there and obviously the things that I've mentioned, the number of, of connected users and so forth and, if, and of course things like algorithms, bots and fakes. But we also do know that, we, that the biggest challenge we have is the human error not actually bots doing that. Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic and the influx of information, good and bad, and all the online uh, messaging that was there, the changing demographic of social media users, it's actually coming into younger generations who tend to be less experienced uh, and, and their content consumption is great, but their experience is lower. A lack of digital literacy and critical thinking skills, which of course allows us to be able to digitally check and, and make sure that things are voracious and of course underlying social cultural and political issues so they were the five key grouped areas that were the challenges that caused the trust breakdown um, from misinformation and disinformation 
And that finishes my part of the presentation. Now I'm going to hand over to Sandrine and she can give an a introduction, first of all, of herself, uh, where she fits in and where she's been. And I will stop sharing so Sandrine can share. And she's got some really first-hand case examples. So over to you, Sandrine. Yes, hi. Thanks, Lisa. That was great. Let me just quickly um, share my screen. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sandrine. I work with uh, MSF. I'm heading a project on mis and disinformation basically a kind of reflection action project where we look at uh, yeah how mis and disinformation has been affecting our work and our projects and yeah how to also preparing ourselves to respond so I'll talk through some of our um, tactics on on responding um, okay so yeah I mean Lisa's laid it out in a in a very uh, comprehensive way. We are living in a changing information environment, and here's a picture from South Sudan, which I think illustrates that even in the most remote areas of the world, you know, internet ac access is growing, and people have access to information on through their mobiles, through three G networks. Um, yeah, and, and, and this is only just growing. So the two areas that we have really identified in MSF that are affecting the humanitarian sector, at least from our perspective, really, I mean, the first is around health misinformation and Lisa gave some great examples about the infodemic. I think we're all pretty aware of how um, health misinformation has really, um, devastated the online environment. We've had a uh, real undermining of trust in, in basics like vaccine provision. And um, yeah, as Lisa also outlined, uh, this is affecting trust in healthcare providers. And then the second area we identified is really around disinformation. Um, and this we see as really um, information shared with malicious intent. And we've seen, we, at least not in my analysis, I don't think humanitarian agencies are particularly a target, but certainly if we're doing anything or saying anything that isn't to the liking of, um, of governments where we work or other actors, we can, you know, have, having disinformation and slander thrown against us on social media is definitely on the cards. And I think you know, if you have a look at the Oxford Internet Institute's um, annual uh, cyber troop survey, they have identified more than 75 countries that use actively use disinformation operations. Um, so that means even the poorest countries are, are using it. Um, so yeah, so I think the humanitarian sector hasn't had a huge number of attacks, but we are definitely on an increasing slope. So how is this affecting MSF's projects? I'll give you an example from Yemen uh, around the COVID outbreak. There was a persistent rumor about a lethal injection saying that if you come to a hospital, you will receive a lethal injection and basically you will die by going to hospital. And it's one of those um, cases where this is misinformation it's not really with an intent to harm anyone in fact the intent is to you know protect others from this um and it's it's a it's a truth in the sense that you know some people who do go to hospital do die um but then it's become distorted um so for us trying to combat this myth i mean it had real world consequences because people we found people persistently coming in late for treatment uh, for COVID, and so therefore being actually much worse um, in their, you know, their oxygen levels, where those, et cetera. So we had to really invest in a kind of community campaign and also in a social media campaign to uh, dispel that rumor and to kind of debunk the, these, these rumors. 
Um, Myanmar is another amazing example of where you have a kind of online battlefield. You have a, a, a sort of, uh, you know, the tension in country and, and fighting as well. Um, and that conflict is playing out online in different on different social media platforms. People are using, for example, Twitter to broadcast um, to an international audience. Um, TikTok is being used by the military to motivate their soldiers and to sort of glorify violence in a way. And then you can see that um, Facebook is being used by some of the um, community groups to crowdsource resources and, and help. Um, so you have different uses of different social media platforms. And then you have the constant use of internet shutdowns, which we're seeing in a lot of humanitarian contexts, especially where there is an authoritarian um, government. And this means that people lose access to information or um, you know, are, are basically unable to communicate. So those are some of the other kind of digital factors that affect um, the information environment. Yeah, so then uh, I'll mention Ukraine. I, I actually just spent two months in Ukraine um, working uh, as a liaison for, for MSF. I think in Ukraine, you know, we've all seen on the news, you've, you've got conflicting narratives. You have one reality presented by the Russian um, uh, media space, and then you've got another reality in the Ukrainian media st space. So for us, what that meant is really stepping up on our social media monitoring and setting up actually a daily um, update, which included so Russian official media, Russian social media, Ukrainian official media, and Ukrainian social media. And then also we added a disinformation narratives section where we actually looked at um, fact-checking organizations like BBC, AFP, and others who were debunking Bellingcat, for example, who were debunking common uh, information narratives that were running. It's, it's tricky, and I think we, we definitely could improve our social media monitoring. But we've done a good job this year. We managed to actually um, do social media monitoring on Telegram, and we want to do more on TikTok, at least to be able to identify have a few hashtags that we follow so that we know what's going on. I think the other thing that happened to us in Ukraine that is of interest is we were used on social media. And we were sort of tagged to uh, spur us into action uh, by, the, by the Ukrainian government and by the Ukrainian uh, social sector to actually request MSF to um, evacuate um, civilians and prisoners of war from the Azovstal plant. So this was a kind of viral campaign that we got swept up in. And it was a very interesting exercise. We still, I, I still want to debrief with the colleagues about it and reflect on it, but um, it was very difficult to know how to respond to that kind of um, campaign because you know it wasn't really our role we weren't really in capacity to do it but it wasn't very clear how we could respond without kind of inflaming things or looking like we didn't care or looking that we wouldn't weren't trying so i think that whole communication strategy is quite important um okay i if people have questions about ukraine i'm, I'm happy also to answer that in the q a but moving on, just a few things about how we're responding. So firstly, we are setting up rumor management uh, tools uh, for our colleagues in the field. And this is really um, a way for us to kind of find out what is being discussed at community level um, and to be able to answer harmful misinformation that's circulating and to address it in a timely manner. And what we found, which is really interesting, is that there's a kind of mix between rumors, misinfo, and community feedback. So even ourselves, we've ended up sort of saying, oh, this is misinformation. And then when you look at it, it actually turns out that someone just complaining about MSF. <laughs> so it's not misinformation, it's just them using social media to you know, say that 
I don't know, they weren't attended on time or they there was a lot of fear about the temperature gun being used. So that's the kind of rumor we picked up on and that we it helped us change our practice so that we would remain accessible. So I think that community level of rumor management is really important. And the second area is really on disinformation. So that's more about the defense um, against digital risks. So as I mentioned, social media monitoring, really stepping that up um, combining it with the media monitoring. Um, there's also a strategy um, called pre-bunking, which is to basically flood the airwaves with positive news about your vaccination campaign or uh, you know, about the services you provide in your clinic. Maybe not positive news, but just explaining how you work and what you do. Um, it's a way of kind of countering uh, misinformation because um, the psychology of misinformation is that you really are attached to the first piece of news you receive on a given topic. So if the first piece of news you receive about vaccinations is that you know they're routine and you know for many years now people are receiving vaccines and they're safe and they actually protect you from dangerous diseases, it's more likely to stick than a than a harmful rumor about vaccination. The other areas on crisis response, so we've worked hard in the past year and a half to improve our um, capacity with our digital teams to respond to um, social media crises. And this means having, we've developed a tool, uh, it's like a threat assessment to know, like, is this tweet dangerous or not? Um, and to kind of assess how to respond to it. And then we've also improved our um, tech company contact so they have emergency teams in the big emergencies that can that work 24 hours and that can take down harmful information so for us it's really essential to have those contacts um on the crisis response there's still work to be done and this is really kind of on on my agenda um and why i i was really happy to see uh, gisf organize this talk is that we need to integrate digital crisis response into our security approach. Um, there, there is no real difference between physical and digital security. You know, if you get an online death threat, you better prepare your team and you know put in protective measures, um, even if that death threat doesn't materialize, which hopefully it doesn't. Um, but I think this we see at least my team and I see digital security and physical security as, as, as part of the same thing. All right, and just my final slide is about um, reflection. So for us, a really important thing is to continue to reflect about how uh, digital societies are, the digital world is affecting the societies where we work. We're also going to be doing certain case studies because each context really has its own unique information ecosystem. And uh, yeah, we really quite like this internews methodology that uh, Lisa was mentioning. And uh, it's something we want to really work on ourselves more. Right, that's it from my side. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting stuff there. It, it's uh, as a complete, um, I won't say a technophobe, but somebody who struggles. It's uh, sometimes concerning that there's so much out there, but it, it's good. But it's not as difficult as we sometimes think when it's explained clearly. It gives us something that we can work with. So thank you both very much. Um, at which point I hand back to Lisa again to carry on um, with case study examples. Yeah, thanks for that. That was a, that was a great presentation of, of uh, you know, practical examples, I think, for everyone, which is fantastic. And we are going to, I'm just going to share screen again. I think, everybody, I think that's the second most uh, stated thing in COVID, apart from you're on mute. Um, I'll just go to the screen. And just following on from Sandrine's um, presentation as well, which sort of highlighted, uh, and this is something I want you to reflect on as we look at the case studies that are here, is that the accountabilities that we have um, might change slightly as 
We've got, in, if you look at broad groupings, we've got individuals, what can we do as individuals uh, to manage risk and, and reduce the spread of misinformation, disinformation, or identify it uh, and, and uh, you know, support communities. There's obviously organisations and there's multitudes of types of organisations. There's, you know, there's governments, there's the NGOs, there's all the stakeholders, there's just the organisations. And then there's the communities that we serve and the communities in which we work. So broad groupings to think about you know when we're looking at strategies to um you know resolve it and as we go into these case studies just think about maybe what the differences are in those different groupings individuals organizations communities as to how we might be accountable um, for our actions and also for identifying and for managing the risk of misinformation and disinformation um, i've got two case studies and uh they're both a little bit different. Um, and the reason I, I show you this is that, again, following on the second of the, of the case studies, um, it follows on from Sandrine's um, presenta presentation in the second one that I give you is the response using rumour tracking, which is really quite interesting. This one, though, um, is a case study out of Nigeria. Um, and just a bit of background here. Um, the Boko Haram uh, and other militant groups have caused approximately 30,000 deaths since 2009 and they've displaced, you know, 2 million people uh, and left, you know, 10, that 10 million people uh, in need of humanitarian assistance, um, according to a news report um, that was checked by Hum Angle. And so they focus on security in Africa. Um, but local and international humanitarian organisations have, have obviously emerged uh, in that environment because it's a crisis environment as a result of um, one, the government's inability to quell the violence. Um, and so they have been there to provide medical care, shelter and other relief materials to victims in vulnerable populations. So through 2021 though, the second half of the, of the pandemic era, um, the targeting of aid workers has been a really consistent challenge uh, and it has resulted in a number of kidnappings, deaths and, and challenges to the life-saving work of NGOs in Northeast Nigeria. So that's a bit of the background. The misinformation challenge though, and this is identified separately, is that again, uh, Hum, Hum Angle, the news media report has said that in some cases, disinformation and misinformation campaigns are propagated by online trolls. So a troll is somebody who follows hashtags and actually deliberately puts that information out there. Propaganda channels, so ones that have deliberate intent to spread um, disinformation and certainly questionable associations that have shifted the blame from the, for the conflict to the NGOs. So it's almost, you know, damage the people that are there to help you. Um, and more worrisome though, uh, in the challenges we got around disinformation, is that um, the trend sees not only um, the shifting of the blame from the perpetrators, the trolls and so forth, but government officials and politicians who've been making unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated claims. So in other words, they have been directly responsible for creating and initiating disinformation. Um, and a series of those ac accusations by the Nigerian government officials against NGOs active in the region were reported again by um, in the main news media. So they went out in main news channels um, including unsubstantiated claims that the NGOs were supplying food and medication to the outlaw armed group. And of course, that meant that these accusations um, meant that the ability for the aid organisations to have trust because their trust's been challenged. In other words, the government is literally saying that they're actually aiding the operations of the perpetrators of the violence uh, in Borno State. And so a multiple number of pieces of information it's almost like that that perfect little storm so you've actually got those who are deliberately creating it and putting it out there and the after effect of course is the lack of trust what i'd like you to do in this session uh, and we can either um i would love people to to turn their mics off and, and and ask questions and join in with some feedback on this we did decide to stay in one group because it saves a little bit of time but I'm just going to flick to, I'll go to the next one because I've got the questions. Oops, it's frozen. Let me go back. Oh, 
the three questions. I did have a slide with the three questions on it. Um, so what I really want you to think about though is to reflect on those same three questions that we had in the Mentimeter. Now I've had some presentations and, and you've read through this. And if somebody wants me to go back to the, to the other um, part of this, the first part, I can I flick back on the slide. But what I'd like you to think about is, um, first of all, you know, what's, what's the intent here? So think about, you know, the, the multiple, um, multiple stakeholders here and what's the intent. And of course, what can we do as an NGO? What, and, and, and then we'll, you know, look at the strategies around that. So what are some of the strategies that would need to be in place here to overcome challenges like this. And there's, there's two parts to this. There's prevent it happening, but now it's already happened. What can we do to overcome that lack of trust? So I'd love some feedback uh, and for you to reflect on those questions. The intent, what can we do? Why is this so harmful? Why is this challenge so harmful? Um, you know, this disinformation challenge so harmful? So. If, if people would like to pop um, answers in the chat and we can follow the chat or would love people to um, uh, turn their cameras off and, and, uh, and come on, on and, and have some feedback, it would be great. everybody just a few minutes to think about it and read through that and Sandrine you might might want to comment actually on on the same thing that you some of the strategies that you mentioned in your presentation here as to um, where there has been a, an occasion of um, misinformation or disinformation in this case uh, and it has caused a problem what have been some of the, the damage that, you know that the, how do how do you how do you repair the damage that's been done Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, you know, we also were hit by that particular <laughs> um, case in in northern Nigeria. Um, and I think any of you who is working with any NGO represented here um, has found the environment in northern Nigeria very difficult. Um, certainly, I mean, we definitely, our analysis was that this was a government um, campaign to um, sideline and control the NGO sector. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what did we do? I don't know what we specifically did, but um, I mean, of course, it's a high risk in the sector because, I mean, A, it can be used by anyone, any official to, this kind of information can be used by any official to block humanitarian access. Um, it can sow doubt in the minds of those who are receiving assistance from NGOs. Um, and yeah, I mean, I definitely see this as a, you know, state-led disinformation. I think what we ended up doing, um, but I don't want to dominate, I, I don't know if anyone else uh, has comments on the, on the Nigeria case, strategies to... Uh, to debunk it. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one, but I think it's interesting too on the multiple layers of it here. So it's almost like once it's initiated, it feeds in others. So um, you know, it was initiated obviously through trolls and propaganda channels. But it's quite interesting then that the government officials then actually get in on the same bandwagon and they actually then pick up elements of it. Uh, because of the, the, the geopolitical influence. So I think there's the, the social engineering that occurs from this level of disinformation and the deliberate intent to cause harm is quite profound, but I think it creates a snowball effect as well. Uh, it, it creates, it also incites anger in those that have got opinions about it. So I think that's another element, another dimension to this. So you know, we could also say the same during COVID, you know, a piece of information might have gone out that was incorrect, but it created 
the snowball effect, people became quite polarised in their views and their opinions. And, of course, that then drives more mis misinformation and disinformation. And so it's quite interesting how social engineering occurs on the, on the various layered levels. Lisa, have you got anything you want to add to, to that one as well? Um, well, I have a question, I think, for Sandrine, but also for you, Lisa. Mm. Um, Sandrine, you mentioned the idea of pre-bunking, so um, getting your information out first. How different would it be depending on where the misinformation is coming from? So in this particular example, you had the original sort of misinformation from you know, trolls and other people, and then it was picked up by the government. How different are your strategies to counter that depending on the source of the, inf the misinformation? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think, I mean, in this case, to be honest, I think these trolls were doing the work of the government. <laughs> um, but, um, or at least they were channeling the, um, the government energy there um, because, you know, it, the government has always tried to control NGO uh, activity in northern Nigeria. So in a sense, for me, it's a bit of a red herring where it's coming from. Um, and I wouldn't, where, I mean, obviously you need to analyze it because you want to also address it with government uh, uh, officials. You know, I think, you know, for me, a strategy would be, yes, to do pre-bunking. So just to explain how we work. Well, actually, yeah, we are giving assistance to you know, um, people on, on both sides of the conflict. Um, and yes, you know, even people who are living in Boko Haram areas who, who may be sympathizing or have family members in Boko Haram still deserve assistance um, if, you know, if they're vulnerable, if they are needy. Um, so really just to explain the principles of neutrality and, and, um, and impartiality in very simple terms and very clear terms. You will have seen, for example, the ICRC do that in Ukraine when they were also accused by the Ukrainian government of being too uh, much focused on, on, on pleasing Russia. Um, and I think here, I mean, I would also address it straight up with the government officials because usually these are people who already we know and we've already got a dialogue with and if they are spreading that kind of rumor then we can sort of face it to them and say okay let's discuss this you know this is not right um ultimately if there is you know a, um hate speech or a pattern of abuse or slander you can also um ask the um tech companies to take it down, but it's not always very obvious, you know, it's, it really has to be a kind of complete lie to be able to, to say, no, listen, we need to take that down, or, or it, it would have to lead to imminent harm. Uh, these are the, you know, at least with Facebook, that's their policy. So I would combine it with a kind of, you know, online campaign, just aimed at just explaining how we work, but then a lot of intensive in-person um, discussions and also probably some engagement with the community leaders and uh, you know explaining how that works but this is quite a common thing by the way this has happened to us also in Cameroon recently and sometimes you know we can't get away with it we can't it's not we can't get away with it we can't escape it and it ends up in the case of Cameroon we've ended up actually having to leave because we um, yeah, it's become too much. So, yeah. I wonder, and, and Lisa, I know, um, you know, we've had discussions about uh, obviously t emerging technologies in supporting um, the efforts of misinformation, you know, detecting misinformation, disinformation. And the interesting concept would be around artificial intelligence. If we can, how much can we utilize new and emerging technologies like AI? to bear in mind, it, and, and most people know that artificial intelligence is not actually intelligent. It just can, can scour through more information than the human mind can. But we need to take, we can often see trends and we might be able to pick up um, trends on hashtags and social media, um, you know, outlets and, and find sources of information, locationing and all those sorts of things. So 
I'd love to get your view potentially on, on maybe that and, and any of the, the participants in the chat as well. So I think obviously people know that I'm a blockchain specialist and of course it does have the ability to verify and authenticate the location, for example, and the origination of data. So do we, do we start to think more about where the sources have come from and we, we educate people in those digital literacy skills and of course, how can we use AI to, because of the volume of information, love to, to get everybody's thoughts on that. Yeah, maybe to say, I mean, definitely AI is like way out of our reach right now. I mean, we still uh, in MSF are still uh, at a basic level with our literacy, digital skills. Um, and certainly it's not something we would invest in uh, because, like I said, for us, the, we're not going to be the ones fighting everything, every all misinformation online, right? We certainly hope the social media companies are doing it, and they are they are using AI for that. And one of the just a, a detail to to say, you know, if you are reporting um, a, a critical incident online to one of the big tech companies, that report is read by AI. So you need to know how to format it as well so that it can be read and processed in a quick way. So I think for sure that those are the tools of the of the big you know, big tech companies, at least from our perspective. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we're not right now not investing in, in AI. And I mean, we just don't have the ambition to, you know, fight all, all misinformation. In fact, I was accused of being a, trying to become a ministry of truth uh, at the beginning of my project. And I was like, no, oh, no, 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 we're not, you know, we're not going to stop the tide of disinformation. That is just not going to happen. But what we can do is try and identify, you know, key contacts and key areas and basically protect our staff and our patients. Um, and that's really where we're at. So it's quite basic at this stage. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a good question there in the in the chat, mm. uh, building off Sandrine's point about trying to counter such claims through public messaging on humanitarian principles and neutrality. Are there examples of where this has worked effectively and where uh, when the disinformation has been taken up by government officials in this way? So um, she was thinking that I think it's Alison has got thinking of comparisons with northern Ethiopia at the moment and the ways to apply lessons learned from other contexts. Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I think definitely um, pre-bunking or, or debunking, you know, clarifying what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you do it is, is, is very good. And I think if you, you can look at um, how the ICRC has done it, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine most recently. And I think they've done a really good job, but they're never going to convince everyone. And, um, you know, once you sow a seed of doubt, I think it's, you know, as Lisa has said, trust is really important. Mm. So I think it can work to kind of clarify who you are, and then you counterbalance with positive stories of what you are doing mm. to kind of exemplify what you've just said you how you work. Um, but certainly Northern Ethiopia is has been a really rough one for us as well. I think all the UN agencies have found it very difficult. There's been a lot of attacks against humanitarian agencies. We had uh, faked videos, um, false security incidents posted online. Ourselves, we were subjected to a kind of trolling operation, pushing our information you know, any report that would, you know, seem to be positive about the government was highly promoted by a bunch of, you know, pro-government trolls and anything that's, that seemed to be against the, um, the government was then promoted by the other side. So it was very difficult to kind of stay out of that maelstrom. Mm. And um, I really want to do actually an analysis of uh, misinformation and how, how we responded in Ethiopia. I think it's just one of those things that we are all learning how mm. to respond. Mm. Um, 
But in the case of Ethiopia as well, you have very motivated um, diaspora groups. So they are highly active. So we found actually our Norwegian colleagues and our uh, Canadian colleagues were getting trolled on, you know, the Norwegian MSF uh, Facebook site and the Canadian MSF Facebook site if we posted information on Ethiopia. So, um, mm. yeah, I mean, I tend to my I, I tend to think of us at least. Yeah, I don't know what your organizations are all like, but uh, we try and have a good active communication. But I think it's very hard and almost impossible to respond to everything. And better actually just to kind of ride it out in some cases and just sort of do like the queen, you know, no comment <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> wave. Just carry on and wave. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. I might just uh, share the, and the reason I'll just share the, the last of the case studies, and it's more actually an example of something you mentioned, Sadrine, which was rumor tracking. So I'll just, uh, let me just share the screen. And to this one, uh, and this is in one of the resources. And I just thought this was interesting because, again, and to your point as well, uh, that um, you know the levels of digital literacy that organisations, you know, uh, NGOs, humanitarian organisations are, are all very different. What I particularly liked about this case study, and um, this was about the Ebola outbreak in two thousand and fourteen, but the response to it was using simply a software tool such as Excel to track uh, rumours. So it's a rumour tracking process. Now, some of the big NGOs bought rumour tracking software and all sorts of other things. And of course, yes, they are expensive and, and they obviously require analysis and so forth. But one of the reasons I did like this particular one was it does actually level it down to probably the digital literacy that many of the organisations are either able to use in the field, and that's another important thing, um, at all can afford to or are at that level four. So there is a link there in the, the resources to this. But this basically was about the uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014, which obviously uh, had a massive effect for West Africans. But the rumours about Ebola were key in hindering the humanitarian support from the affected population. Um, Internews established the Information Saves Lives program as a result of the misinformation um, that occurred to try and tackle rumours and provide, you know, voracious answers or, you know, truthful answers um, that were being used and unchecked by, you know, uh, out in the field. And so they started using cultural and medical experts and training journalists on how to write better um, and, 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 you know, make sure that the information that was produced in the media was, um, you know, done adequately. And so this, this one was really about, um, you know, how they responded was it was based on the collected rumours and information and, and interviews provided training based on those rumours. So they actually found the rumours, tracked the rumours, then did training, then did a, a um, Save Lives program, Information Saves Lives program to try and debunk, if you like, um, and, uh, you know, get rid of that misinformation because they, I think they figured that they couldn't stop it, but they could do a lot about correcting it and getting the correct information out there and, of course, then using the same channels that spread the misinformation to spread the factual information. So I think this was really important in the sense that, um, you know, some of the takeaways for those that are listening is that the tools that we might use you know, it can be an Excel spreadsheet, basically, uh, or in, in actual fact, it could be a notebook, but it's, it's really just about tracking those rumours, report a bit, re people reporting it. And I guess that's the other thing, isn't it, that, that we need to think about is that it is a cultural um, uh, maturity of an organisation to have transparency and confidence that if they're not sure of something or they think it's a rumour that they can report it without any fear of harm or blame or, you know, any of those things. So I think a, a culture of um, supported, um, you know, risk management, I think is very important here as well, because sometimes people may feel a little foolish if, they, if they've spread information or misinformation and not known. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a real cultural maturity in here, but I think that the takeaway for this particular one was the fact that the tools that they were using for the rumour tracking were something as simple as a spreadsheet. And so I think 
you know, that's that's sort of some of the takeaways. Uh, and Lisa, you might want to comment on that as well. I, I, yeah, I think it's an interesting point and this idea around technologies and different technologies and how sometimes um, there seems to be a rush to more complex technology. Mm. Sometimes a spreadsheet is actually the right answer. Mm. And I think that sometimes concerns me and I think that's something that the project that GISF is currently looking at around the sort of security in the digital world is is you know what's the appropriate response to some of these things and and i think the other thing that is is a real problem within the security people a lot of the time is about not sharing information how do we really learn between organizations about what has worked and what hasn't worked and come with can we come together more to do sort of joint pre-bunking and debunking of information rather than it being one organization response mm. so i think there's some there's so there's so much information um but just around what's appropriate and and how do we how do we really bring our resources together um so that we can multiply the effect mm. I think it's a good point, uh, Lise, as well, in the sense that, you know, we, we, we think about, um, you know, collaborative um, rumour tracking, if you like, um, between organisations and trends in the types of, of uh, misinformation, disinformation that's out there and, you know, propagandas and so forth. I mean, let's face it, we have a centralised, you know, uh, tsunami tracking system, warning system, uh, but do we have a, you know, a centralised and or collaborative view of some of the uh, challenges that we've got and the information and that's that's out there. You know, where where different NGOs can collaborate and work together, as you said, to collectively debunk and demystify instead of having to generate so many resources to to you know reinvent the wheel each time. So you know, I wonder if that's a that's an area that that given the volume of information, we will never we will never stop. The volume of information and probably won't stop the volume and, and speed with which it, it can transmit but we can also use that to our advantage if we can collaborate uh, and and put our pull our resources to think about what are the sort of warnings that we you know and and, and uh, demystifiers that can, can go out there and be used in, in the in the sector and mm. uh, i mean sandrine do you have any Good example experiences you can share where organisations have managed to work together in in some of this, um, either you know the rumour tracking or the response to the rumours. Mm. Um, I yeah, it's and I think that's I I don't know if about um, any joint action. I'm just trying to think. I know. I mean, one of the things I, I think is great about Internews, and they have some fantastic resources, I really recommend them, um, is that actually they looking they look at very context specific um, responses because so much has to do with culture and understanding. So one of the things I've really encouraged also in MSF is that we have a global network of uh, digital uh, colleagues who are able also to step in and understand because so many things are like memes and jokes and particular ways of expression on social media that you can't really get you know if you're not from that culture if you don't speak that language if you don't get that you know reference haha that's actually a double you know a joke an in joke about an in joke so I do think that you know um, understanding internet culture is really important and one of the things I really like about the work of uh, Internews is that they, they have this um, approach called information ecosystem analysis, which I think you, you referenced, uh, Lisa, as well, mm. which is um, basically looking in to how different people in the society where you're working, in the community where you're working, receive their information and what information source they trust. And often it's a very generational thing. So you have, you know, older generation, certainly in Ukraine, it's like that, 
older generation is watching TV, you know, and actually a lot of them watching Russian TV, and then younger generation accessing, you know, different channels, Telegram, TikTok, etc. So I think, um, and then of course, everyone triangulates information, right? And, you know, everyone kind of gets their info and they 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 connect it so you'll often have a kind of real world influencer in the middle of of the story and and we found actually that influencers um so it could be you know religious figures or just like uh, pop celebrity local celebs <laughs> um and national celebs as well they can all play a really important role on messaging around things like um uh you know uh, health messaging i think uh, one alliance I can refer to actually now that I'm talking about it is the um, World Health Organization has a East Africa Information Alliance and the Federation is in it, uh, Red Cross Societies and quite a few other organizations and they basically are, are using a central resource to track rumors and sort of flag different rumors around, it was built around the COVID response. Um, and there you have also very negative influencer cases, like you have presidents of certain countries who are promoting, you know, sort of herbal remedies against COVID and making money off it. Um, so you have to kind of counter these things in a very kind of delicate way because there is a lot of politics going on. So, so yeah, so I think that WHO initiative and the work they've done on the infodemic is really worthwhile, at least on the health side and on rumor management. And they have some free courses you can take online. So highly recommend it as well. Mm. That's really great. And if you've got those resources on where we can people can find those free courses, um, that would be great. And I know Megan will share those on. Mm. Um, I mean, thank you so much for both of you. We're, we're unfortunately coming to the end. I can't believe this has gone so quickly. Um, put you on the spot a bit to both of you if there's one thing that you recommend organizations do to start trying to counter the mis and disinformation what would it be so lisa first to you yeah mine would be to slow down the pace of instantaneousness so in other words just to slow down because i think social media has engendered an instantaneous response to everything. Uh, and so we receive it, we, we deal with it, we disseminate it, it's almost instantaneous. You know, we, we tweet out 160 characters, we re, repost LinkedIn, we reshare Facebook, we do everything and it's, it's in, we sit there and we scroll through and we are instantaneous. So I'd say as individuals and even as organisations is to train people and to think less quickly, to slow it down, just so that you can absorb what you're reading check the facts, get it, get it from a number of different sources and find out before you pass it on. So it's like break, because we already know it's human, it's humans that are doing it faster than bots. So I guess it's if we can break that chain, that's actually a human interaction. It's not a technology interaction. So I think that's an easier, easier thing to do in many ways than it is to actually, you know, uh, try and detect it um, by any other way. So I just say slow down. Lovely, thank you. And Sandrine? Yeah, that's a great one, Lisa. I agree. <laughs> um, I, I think from an organisational perspective, what I found really important is really to invest in your digital teams. And certainly in MSF, uh, they're like the, the most marginalised <laughs> in the sense of um, they tend to be young, they tend to be... Uh, kind of dominated by kind of old media comms people and I think actually they know what they're doing they understand the information environment and I think they have a lot to bring at least that was my experience so I would yeah I would recommend that great thank you um two really good pieces of advice and I think the interesting thing as Lisa said it's it's about the human behavior that we need to look at not just the technology. And I think that's sometimes what we forget um, is, is those are the, the issues. Mm. 
Um, so I'd like to, to thank everybody for attending, um, for Lisa for, for pulling this session together, for Megan for all her hard work in making sure these sessions run smoothly. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the last of our sessions during HMPW. There's been about I think, nine um, different sessions we've run over the last three weeks. Uh, security in the digital world has been one of our priorities, along with um, looking at a more person-centered, inclusive approach to security risk management. If you've enjoyed um, this presentation, if you've enjoyed others uh, that you've attended during HNPW and you want to get more involved in the conversation, um, either to assist with the research work that GISF is doing or to join the bigger conversation in HMBW about how do we integrate security risk management across the humanitarian sector. Do please reach out to us at GISF. We'd be very happy to welcome more people into the discussion. So thank you all very much for your time. Um, and I look forward to carrying this on in the future. Thank you, Lisa and Sandrine. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. The people doing the world's most important work are up against the biggest challenges. Since the 90s, security incidents involving NGOs have increased as their independence and impartiality no longer protect them. Humanitarians are actively targeted, as well as exposed to the risks of conflict and disaster, facing kidnapping, injury and death in order to help those in need. And the threats to their safety means their ability to help diminishes too. NGOs began to create roles for dedicated security professionals, but they often lacked support and resources and worked in isolation. In 2006, a group of them from the UK and Ireland got together to develop coherent approaches to security risk management in the humanitarian space, eventually becoming an established network, the European Interagency Security Forum. With a strategic, inclusive and collaborative focus, the Forum has created a centre of excellence, facilitates a peer-to-peer -peer network, builds capacity for security risk management and provides a voice for practitioners, reaching over a hundred members. In response to growing demand, it has now gone global, bringing different perspectives expertise and resources to make core activities such as original research, trainings, workshops and knowledge sharing more impactful than ever. As a result, organizations are able to build their security risk management on an even stronger foundation to keep more aid workers safe and enable sustainable access to communities in need. With a vision to see the work of the whole third sector done more effectively by supporting NGOs around the world, we are the Global Interagency Security Forum.